I th you know, my main criticism, as I said in the video at the time, is that I don't think Max would have made that move had there been a row of trees on the outside of that corner or a brick wall. And I think that is the ultimate deciding factor on whether a move is a good move or not. And Max, I don't think would have done that if it had been, I don't know, Kevin Magnuson or even Charles Leclerc. But uh, he did it because it was Lando and he thinks, you know, he probably thinks Lando's a bit of a soft target, I would guess. And, and he would just catch him by surprise. But um, I think he misjudged it and I think there wasn't enough room. Did he cost Lando Norris more points in the championship than he lost by virtue of his 22nd penalty? But was that a, an Ayrton Senna-esque move or, or something that was reminiscent of Michael Schumacher if indeed you want to win a championship and you're prepared to do anything to get it? Hello and welcome to another episode of the F1 Hour with my friend and yours, the goatiest F1 mind to have ever goated, <laughs> the one they call Peter D. Windsor. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well, thanks, Cam. Good to see you. Good man, good man. There are a couple of F1 threads at which we need to pull on the back of the Mexican Grand Prix, <laughs> sir, are there not? Talk to me, Peter, as is compulsory, mandatory even. What do you think was the biggest story to come out of the Mexican Grand Prix? Oh, Carlos Sainz not only blowing away his teammate, but blowing away the guy in the fastest car in the race and winning the Grand Prix. Uh, I thought that was just outstanding. To the backdrop of, of the team that's sacking him at the end of the year, because obviously he's quite patently not good enough to keep his place at Ferrari. <laughs> what a day for Carlos Sainz. What a day for sport in general. I think that was just uh, one of the best things I've seen for a long time. I thought he was just superb. Um, you know, and I think the decision by Ferrari to stand down Charles Leclerc in, in FP1 and the decision by McLaren to stand down Lando Norris in FP1 it showed in the results, didn't it? I just couldn't get my head around. I mean, Ferrari I can accept because Charles not exactly in the running for the world championship. But when you've got a guy like Lando who quite patently could be putting Max under a lot of pressure, a lot more if they hadn't already burnt 34 points that he could have had to his credit, um, to stand him down in FP1 after all that, and after the, I think it was Andre Stella said, you know, from now on, every point counts. And then they stand their lead driver down in FP1 and he's playing catch up for the rest of the weekend. As Charles admitted, you know, he was on the back foot from day one this weekend. And it's pretty basic stuff, isn't it? You know, if you've got a driver who's in contention and he's got a quick car, you give him as much seat time as possible. Surely it's limited enough as it is. And there's Lando standing around watching, you know, who was it? Pato Award driving the car. Yeah, it's bonkers. Crazy, absolutely crazy. But I mean, Carlos saw all that, took maximum advantage of it and beat them both. Good on him. And, <laughs> you know, totally, totally respect him for just putting his head down and driving driving the perfect weekend, not only race. And as he said, you know, he got two pole positions, didn't he? Both laps would have been on the pole. He was incredible, Carlos Sainz Jr. Some are saying, Peter, that when Lewis arrives there next year at Scuderia Ferrari, that Lewis will need to thank... Carlos Sainz Jr. for the rate at which he's developed that car, for bringing that red car, making it a championship winning machine. True or false, Peter? No, nah, I think that's that's pretty ludicrous. I think that's the team in general, the engineers. It's Freddie Basseur should take most of the credit for that. And it's a very good car, but you do need to spend time in it and you do need to to get it absolutely right. And And Carlos did that did that really well. Charles didn't have as much time in it. No, it's not. It's nothing to do with that. It's just to do with how well he's driving the car that is very good now. And that's, that's all it comes down to. And yeah, you know, Lewis should be right up there from day one. It's obviously a very good car now. And that's, you know, for the Lewis fans, that's a brilliant thing. Where Shame for Carlos is all I can say, because, you know, he doesn't deserve not to be in that car next year. A hundred percent, Peter. And I know that you have your, your stance on Ferrari getting rid of Carlos has been quite hard line that you say that yeah. It, yeah. it feels and smells and looks like a mistake that Charles and Carlos together are like almost like the perfect dynamic as far as a team pairing. Uh, yeah, let, if let you've me, got a Rolex, you don't go and get a tag higher. <laughs> Oops, shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> let me pitch the question at you this way though, Peter. Some say that if Lewis comes up on the market, regardless of which of the 10 teams you are on the grid, if you have the financial resources, it doesn't matter who, unless you have a Max Verstappen in your team or maybe a Fernando Alonso as well, that you, you almost go out and get Lewis Hamilton irrespective of anything else. 
Uh, how do you reconcile those two? Do you think it's ca can it still be a mistake to get rid of Carlos if indeed you can get yourself a Lewis Hamilton in his stead? Well, I wouldn't include Fernando there. I would say that applies to Max, Lewis and Charles. And if you've got one of those three, you don't need a super, super quick driver in the other car. And I think it kind of applies to Lando as well, because let's face it, if Daniel Ricciardo was still at McLaren and they'd never sacked him, I think Lando would probably have at least 25 points more than he has now. Yeah. And they'd still be leading the Constructors' Championship. And so that just shows the folly of this business of trying to have the two best guys you can get. And I think if you've got Charles Leclerc, you don't need Lewis Hamilton. That's my bottom line. I think you need somebody like Carlos Sainz, who's not obviously... A bet, as good as Lewis as an all-round racing driver, but he's not far away from being the perfect number two for Charles Leclerc. I think he is the perfect number two for Charles Leclerc because he can win races when Charles has an off weekend, mm -hmm. as he did in Mexico. You know, he got beaten by McLaren, and and that's the point. Of course, if you're if if he's on the market and you don't have a Max and you don't have a Charles and Lewis is on the market, you go for Lewis, but. You do have a shell at Ferrari, and that's my point. That's always been my point, and and I don't think it brings the best. I don't think Lewis will bring the best out in Charles, to be honest, because I think he'll be quick. He'll be really quick, and he'll be very polished in some areas where Carlos isn't, and Charles will find that annoying and distracting. In the same way Lewis has found, sorry, in the same way uh, Lando's found Oscar distract distracting. Wow, wow, blimey foreshadowing Mr. Wins. Yeah, I think with be... Fernando, it's a different thing. You know, with Fernando, he's just going to defend his side of the garage against all intruders. And for, Lan for, for Fernando, it's a perfect thing to be in that Stroll team because Stroll's never going to give him a hard time. And all he's got to do is look after the kid and the boss and he's home and dry sort of thing. And it's his team. But what you would never do is put Charles Leclerc in the other Aston Martin or Max Verstappen. You know, imagine what Fernando would do then. Oh, my goodness. Ka chaos. Mr. Yeah, Windsor. exactly. Yeah, you know, you've got to look at the driver you've got and, and and be satisfied with what you've got and bring the best out in him. And you know, as I said, from the minute they hired Oscar Piastri, it was not going to be the best thing for Lando Norris to have Os somebody as quick as Oscar in that car. And I still stand by that. Blimey. I interesting, Mr. Mm. Windsor. Shall we talk about the elephant in the room, turn four, turn seven? How did you characterise the incident, incident even between... Max and Lando was do, do, do you agree disagree with the penalty think that it should have been more or less well for I'm the wrong person to ask because you know my views on the whole business of the sporting regulation governing somebody attempting to pass on the outside I think it's ludicrous I think if you've got the inside it's your corner and if you want to pass on the outside at your peril have a go but if the guy wants to use all the road you're going to be in trouble. That's always been my view. And I think that is what motor racing is all about. And they changed that to favor the guy on the outside purely because they want more overtaking in Formula One. And it's pathetic, really, because the overtakes that now do occur when people do obey the rules are just, well, they're just banal. There's somebody on the outside. Oh, he's on my outside. I'll break now and let him pass. And everybody claps and applauds and says, oh, wow, look, two cars can go through that together. But it's not motor racing. Motor racing is using all the road. And, and equally, if you want to go down the outside, doing it at the right moment, at the right place and getting the pass. And it'll be an amazing pass, like Nigel Mansell going into Pirotella in, uh, in Mexico City, passing Gerhard Berger on the outside. That's, a, that's, a, that's an overtake. Anyway, so I'm the wrong person to ask there. And, you know, I, I, the only thing I would say that from Red Bull and Max's point of view, that it's pretty clear after Austin that they got away with that pretty well. And they needed to sort of be a bit careful in Mexico because you didn't have to be a mastermind to know that the stewards were going to be after him to try to look as if they're not, you know, partial. And, uh, and so that's, they should have been, he should have been a lot more circumspect, I think, there. I think for the other one, it's... I don't think he would have done that if it had been anybody but Lando for a start. And secondly, it reminded me a lot of, of Cops Corner, Silverstone 21, oh. and Lewis doing the same to, to Max. Now, there were a lot of people criticizing Lewis at the time, saying you know it wasn't a place to overtake and he should never have done that. The corner was too quick and it could have led to a serious injury for Max and everything else. I said at the time that you know Max knows Lewis well enough and knows how he drives and shouldn't have left the door as wide open as he had. And, and it didn't surprise me that Lewis, having got a bit of momentum out of the previous tight corner down the old pit straight, 
uh, would have gone for the inside. And Max should have read that. And that's what I said at the time. And so I said, in general, I think it was 50-50, you know, Max should have done a better job anticipating what Lewis is going to do. And Lewis maybe was a bit ambitious, but, you know, he did get away with it at the end of the day sort of thing. And I think it's the same with that. It's a similar sort of corner, isn't it? It's not a place where you'd normally expect anybody to go down the inside. Admittedly, it's a left-hander, Cops is a right-hander. Um, and Max, I don't think, would have done that if it had been, I don't know, Kevin Magnuson or even Charles Leclerc. But uh, he did it because it was Lando, and he thinks... You know, he probably thinks Lando's a bit of a soft target, I would guess. And and he would just catch him by surprise. But um, I think he misjudged it. And I think there wasn't enough room. Having said that, I'm surprised Lando left as much gap as he did, knowing it was Max there. I'm, you know, I'm saying the same thing kind of that I said about Max in reverse, because, you know, it is Max Verstappen. And you, you've got to think of every gap where he's going to go. And he is a racer. And you can't, that's a good thing. You know, you can't have, on the one hand, say, we want more overtaking in Formula One, which apparently is what the fans worldwide want. And at the same time, say, oh, this guy's too aggressive. He's trying to overtake too much. You know, you can only have one or make your mind up, is my, my opinion. And um, I think Lando should have, and he, he was okay there, but I mean, if that had been Piastri, would he have left the door open that much after what Piastri's been doing to him recently? Probably not. Um, I think he would have if it had been Lewis, maybe George, but with its max, you don't leave the door open that much. But having said that, I, you know, my main criticism, as I said in the video at the time, is that I don't think Max would have made that move had there been a row of trees on the outside of that corner or a brick wall. And I think that is the ultimate deciding factor on whether a move is a good move or not. And I think Max did that because subliminally he's aware that if it goes wrong, there's a massive runoff area there and they're going to be okay. And I think in that respect, it was a poor piece of judgment by Max because it wasn't motor racing on the track that they were given. It was motor racing on the track they were given on the proviso that if something goes wrong, they're going to be okay. And that's not how it should be. That's what track limits in theory are all about. And, and so in that respect, yeah, I think he, he should have reined himself in and shouldn't have done that. And I think that was probably a big mistake. And and I put it in the same heading as the last one. You know, after what happened in Austin, it was pretty obvious that he was going to get penalised pretty strictly in Mexico if he put a foot out of line. And he went and did it twice, which was a bit odd, really. I'm surprised that nobody at Red Bull had been more vociferous before the race in telling him that because... If, you know, if I'd been there, that's what I would have been saying for sure. You know, and if that in the Williams days, that we were always aware of the stewards then. I'd often be saying that sort of thing to Nigel, just anticipating what they're going to do if something happens. And uh, I don't know whether they did or they didn't, and Max ignored it. I suppose the only other thing you could say is that Max had his head full of the fact that yet again, he seemed to have some sort of battery problem on the car and didn't have any power and by his standards, and was annoyed and probably had a red mist about that. But then again, you know, he's a pro and he should be able to control that. But it's, it's shocking, isn't it, how many times Red Bull this year have managed to hmm. give Max less than 100% power yeah. from that power unit. And he's had he's been complaining about, you know, all the stuff that goes on with these hybrid engines, which is really annoying. It must be unbelievably irritating for him if he drives, you know, a really good lap to be on the front row, and then he's got no power for the first five laps. Yeah. What must that feel like? I mean, tough to deal with, eh? Yeah, yeah. got to be tough to deal with. Go on, yeah. then, go on, then, Mister Windsor. I can mm. hear our ne our fans from the Netherlands saying, "Windsor and Cameron, British boys, what are you talking about?" And that's only confounded by the fact that Damon Hill has come out and called uh, Max Verstappen um, incapable of playing fair that if everybody drives like max then nobody will ever make an overtake ever again in formula one what do you make of those comments mr windsor and is is british bias a thing when we're assessing formula one in real time i don't know about british bias i never read the press or look at what anybody else is saying so i can't really react to that one cameron i i just think about racing as i know it and what i believe in and i'm not being massively critical of Max because I, I like the fact that he's aggressive and, and and I don't agree with Damon that if everybody drove like Max, there'd be no more overtaking. I think on the contrary, there'd be a lot of, there'd probably be, be a lot more if people actually did drive like Max with shorter corners and really chose their moments. I think Max's track craft is absolutely brilliant. All I'm saying is really about Max that is that uh, I think, you know, given how easily he just ran off the road there, 
it was pretty clear that he was aware of the amount of runoff area. And I think that's a point that needs to be taken into account. First point. And secondly, I don't think they read the stewards very well and what the stewards mm -hmm. are going to be doing. And that's not a criticism. It's just, well, it is a criticism. It's not saying Max isn't any good or this or, this or that, or he's bad for Formula One. I think he's brilliant. And I love watching him drive and I love watching his, his aggression. But I think they just chose their moments wrongly and Red Bull should have been on top of that. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think... I'd love to see more drivers being as aggressive as as Max, but I'm not sure. I mean, bear in mind, it's not just Max being aggressive and creating gaps when perhaps gaps aren't there. It's because he's so able to position the car really, really well. And that's a point I've been making ad nauseum over the last five years, probably. And I think the same applies to Lewis and Charles. Lewis is obviously much less aggressive than, than Max these days in terms of traffic. Charles, I think, wants to be, but he's always on the edge. But Max is the guy that's always got the car relatively flat. Even if he's under braking, he's got the loads absolutely perfectly proportioned. And with respect, I don't think there are many other Grand Prix drivers who are out there commentating at the moment who actually know what that is all about. Because most of the drivers that I can think of who are out there in the commentary field at the moment are all drivers that have, that were, were, always had a lot of load on the car going into a corner and couldn't really do what Max does. And Max is doing that because he's actually working in a different stratosphere than most of them. And that's why maybe he looks like he's doing outlandish things, but he's not. He's actually doing things within his own world that actually work really well. And yeah, he misjudged that for sure. But equally, um, he's pulled off some amazing passes and, you know, we shouldn't just criticize him for that one, one pass. I don't think, um, do, do, and do, where would he have where would he have finished anyway? You know, he would have that, that he would have got beaten questions. by Leclerc. He would have finished what? And he would have got beaten. He probably would have been what fifth, fourth four, or fifth. Four, you know, fourth, fifth. some speculate. Yeah, you know, for him the race he had no power. The whole thing was a mess anyway. You know, what was it all about? With, with, with his championship cap on then, and and that Max Verstappen mm. level of ruthlessness that's come to characterize or epitomize even his driving style. Do you think Max did the right thing? It, 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 was there what I mean by that, Peter, is mm. did he extract, did he cost Lando Norris more points in the championship than he lost by virtue of his 22nd penalty? But was that a, an Ayrton Senna-esque move or, or something that was reminiscent of Michael Schumacher if indeed you want to win a championship and you're prepared to do anything to get it? Um, it's a good question. You know, did Max actually think was there a third element to this, which was, and if we collide, we're both out of the race. That's good for me. As we, as I'm sure he was thinking in 21, I'd like to give Max the benefit of the doubt and say that I don't think it was that, but you know, I'm not a mind reader in that respect. I don't think any of us are. And I, you know, I would, I would, as I say, I'd give Max the benefit of the doubt there. I don't think that was necessarily a place where you could take the guy out. If you wanted to just deliberately take him out, you just T-bone him into one, wouldn't you? That sort of thing. Was, oh, the brakes froze or whatever. <laughs> Not sure you'd do it into that corner. Uh, I think it was more just, I got to get past this guy. I'm yeah. a racer. And, you know, I don't like having cars in front of me, which is what we all want racing drivers to, to be yeah. like. Um, so, I mean, from Max's point of view and Red Bull's point of view, Again, incredible damage limitation, really, because A, he got a few points, not many, but beyond that, the guy in the fastest car didn't win the race. And that was Lew that was Lando Norris. And, you know, that was quite a big lack, lack of points there that Carlos Sainz counted for with Lando. Yeah. And, you know, that, I mean, that, that, I just put that down to McLaren not running him in FP1, to be honest. Wow. You wow. Know? I think that was, you know, I think had he run FP1, I think he probably would have been on the front row. He would have got a little bit more out of that car in Q3. And I think he might have led into the first corner. If not, I think he would have got the lead quite early on. Oh. Do you think it counts for, I know this is F1 and it's a story told in tents and every millisecond matters. But you would think that these F1 drivers could forego, and I know it was an anomalous circumstance as far as F2, when they only had 30 minutes because they were testing 2025 20, tyres back, which I thought was quite ridiculous. But do you think those at those minutes, the 60 minutes in FP1 counts for that much and that Orlando can't give the car to a, a, a rookie? Do you, do you know what I mean? Do you think that the... Yeah, I do. I Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, it's, not only, it's not only the 60 minutes. It's another guy driving your car, and yeah. in the case of Charles Leclerc, another guy damaging your car even if it's not his fault. It's just everything is not 
the same, is it? You know, mm -hmm. and you, if you know racing drivers really well, you know them personally and you kind of share their lives with them, as I've been lucky enough over the years to do. A racing car, their racing car is incredibly personal to them. The last thing you want to do is sitting around in the garage watching somebody else drive your race car, even if it just makes you a bit nervous and on edge for that 60 minutes. It's the damage is done then, let alone the mileage you should be getting in that car. And everybody said, all the drivers, all the teams, it's a very difficult weekend, Mexico, with, with the balance you got between downforce, top speed, lack of, lack of downforce, the grip, everything else changing, the track evolution. It was difficult wind it was a difficult weekend you needed to be in that car and i'm sure it was you know it was lando's turn to stand down but you know none of this would be we wouldn't be talking about this if formula one had a proper second tier world championship for the rookies as i've been saying for i don't know how long and if we had that we wouldn't need to be putting them in the cars in the middle of a grand prix weekend yeah it's a good shout speaking of yeah. which and it's an evolution of when we used to have three cars and you'd, and you'd let the rookie run in a third car or something like that, you know, a spare car at least, but not in the race cars, you know, race cars are really personal things. Yeah. Yeah. Don't disagree. Mr. Windsor. Speaking mm. of which, since you're touching on rookies, let me not bury the mm. lead. It feels like it's been a bit of a paradigm shift as far as the attitudes towards rookies, even as recently as 12 months ago, you would always, if you had a spot, give it to a, a Kevin Magnussen or a Hulkenberg, a trusted hand with experience in Formula One. Now, all of a sudden, you've got Colapinto in there and he's he looks like he's been in F1 years and years. You've got Behrman next year. You've got Antonelli next year. You've got Bartoletto hanging around, sniffing mm -hmm. around an Audi seat. Peter, let me ask you the question this way. What, why all of a sudden are rookies adapting so seamlessly from F2 to F1. What what what's changed here? Because they were struggling a couple of well, Logan Sargent struggled. Joe is still struggling. What's changed between now and then? Uh, well, what's changed between Lo the Logan Sargent Joe era and now? I can only think that it is more ability to work in the sim and to develop your skills relatively closely to those of the active drivers and to know the circuits therefore incredibly well and to get in and do a higher level job as a result. What I don't think has changed is how difficult it is to do the last two tenths of a lap. So in reality, I don't think that much has changed. I think it's always been relatively easy for a very good rookie to come into Formula One and be within four tenths of the pace on day one, whether it's Jackie Stewart, Mario Andretti taking the pole for his first race, or Carlos Reutemann doing the same, or Jacques Villeneuve. You, get, you, you have these examples, Ignacio Giunti. You have these examples of drivers just coming in. It's always been the case. And if you're very talented, you will be right up to speed. The only thing that is always there as an intangible is this last few tenths of a second, which is not something you can gain on a sim. It's not something the engineers ever talk about because they can't measure it. It's purely down to touch and feel, to genes, if you like, and also to determination and self-criticism. And right now, I would still say only Max, Lewis, Charles, those three. I would say those three still have something that none of the other drivers have. And no matter how much work Franco Colapinto does, he's never going to be at that level until he shortens his corners considerably on a consistent basis. And I think the same with Lando. As good as Lando is and as good as his touch is, he's never going to be able to beat on a regular basis a Max Verstappen because Max has shorter corners. Simple as that. You know, it's, it's, it's either an arithmetic thing or a feel thing, whichever you want to look at it, but it's, but it's there. Carlos has, has almost got to the level of, of Lando Norris now. So he's at the level of Lando Norris in terms of the way he's softened all his inputs over the last 18 months, two years. His corners now are a little bit tighter than, than they used to be. And I think that's just years of living with Charles Leclerc. Mm. And so therefore, I'd say he's right there with Lando. And Oscar, I think, is still shorter than both of them. But he's got other issues where he's still a bit aggressive, over-aggressive on the throttle and the, and the brakes. 
But steering wise, he's got incredible handwork, I would say, about Oscar Piastri. And all those things I'm talking about there, none of those apply to a Franco coming in and going well or uh, an Isaac Hadja coming in and going well. Hmm. Those are things to do with, yeah, the ability for people to to be there or thereabouts is definitely improved and all the facilities are there for it. Yeah. But don't confuse Colapinto going very well, going as well as Alex Albon or slightly better with Alec, with Franco Colapinto suddenly being the next Max Verstappen Oof. because you only got to look at the way he drives to see that he's got longer corners. End of story. You know, But he, does, he could well be the next Carlos Sainz in that sense. So we need to be very discerning and, 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 and clearly understand the way these guys perform. Of the new young drivers, I'd say Antonelli, to my eye, has got the shortest corners so far of that new group. I think we saw it and it was there in, you know, evidence in Mexico, but Liam Lawson's definitely got quite long corners and he's definitely sort of loads up the rear. That's the way he drives. Very aggressive, very fast, great car control, but very prone to mistakes because he's always trying to break as late as possible and get on the power as soon as possible. And that's the recipe for not being able to manage the car, manipulate the car. Great to have that sort of guy in Formula One. There's always a place for him. Brilliant to have Ronnie Peterson, Jochen Rint, Liam mm -hmm. Lawson, you know, but He's not, at the moment, he doesn't look like he's going in the path of a Max Verstappen or a Lewis Hamilton in the way he drives. And we're lucky to have had those two guys and Charles in this era, I think. And I hope they get more, even more celebration than they have. Oh, so speaking of Liam Lawson, with a view not to bury the lead, do you think, per your, um, your inside the paddock contacts, Mr. Mm -hmm. Windsor, that Checo Perez might have raced his last race for Red Bull? Because many are saying that his performance, his material underperformance versus where they expected versus his teammate Max Verstappen in the same car. Yet again at the Mexican Grand Prix, his home Grand Prix, by the way, he doesn't even get out of Q1. Is this, do, do Red Bull need to draw a line underneath the Checo Perez sand now, Peter? I think they do. Uh, it's very clear that he's he needs a lot of work and a lot of, you know, he needs a very good car with very good balance, very good... Uh, tire warm up, very good brake warm up, all those things that you know come with a good car. And if he doesn't, he's always going to be struggling. Which is, you know, he doesn't have the variables that Max can play with. He doesn't have anything like the same repertoire, and he's driving as Max. And so that's the reason we're seeing that. Just on that though, imagine if Max had had to sit out FP one as well. You know, oh. Red Bull would have been really in trouble that weekend. Anyway, um, we're still. Perez. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think I, it's difficult to imagine that Red Bull wouldn't be saying now, now nah, we've got to get somebody, somebody better in the car. And I, you know, I find it incomprehensible that they wouldn't be thinking Carlos Sainz because, you know, wow, what a combination that would be. Max Verstappen, Carlos Sainz, get him out of that Williams deal, put Colo Pinto in the Williams and run Carlos Sainz. What a, you know, that would, that's absolute slam dunk, logical deal which means, of course, it won't happen because nothing logical ever seems to happen in Formula One. And they'll probably go and put Liam Lawson in the car or something. You know, nothing wrong with Liam Lawson. But, I mean, why put him in the car when you've got Carlos Sainz there, a polished Grand Prix winner who's super quick and hungry still uh, and, and isn't going to give Max a hard time in the way that, you know, a Charles would or a Lewis would or a George would. I, I, so he's the perfect driver for Red Bull right now. I just hope they do it. You know, hard to believe that they will, but I just hope they do I, you know, Peter, I think the only uh, the only potential stumbling block to your suggestion is the fact that not necessarily Carlos Sainz Jr., but it's Carlos Sainz Sr., isn't it? The fact that back in the day, 2015-16, that Sainz Sr. and Joss, father of Max, that they weren't cosy bedfellows and it, it caused a lot of friction, did it, in the, in the garage. And I suppose where Red Bull are coming from most recently over the last six to 12 months, PR allegation gates, Joss and Christian not getting along. The question in, in Christian's mind as far as Carlos Sainz is, is do I need any more rancor and friction in the team as at October 2024? I think that will be Christian's point of contention. Would you, would you, is that a cost that you think is worth paying for a talent as substantial as Carlos well, Sainz? Yeah. I think if what you say is correct, and I've got my doubts, to be honest, with respect to you, um, and Carlos Jr. said to his dad, look, I can do this Red Bull deal, but 
I've got to make sure you're not in the garage. What's his dad going to say? His dad's going to say, oh, don't do it then. Of course he's going to say, yeah, okay, I'll hang out. In the, I'll, go, I'll go and watch the race in the grandstands. No problem for me. Go and win some more, buddy. Hmm. Um, that's what he's dad. I mean, but that period, I remember I, 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 was, I spent a lot of time with Carlos Sr. at that time. When he, we talking about when, when Carlos was in Toro Rosso, right? Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, we used to hang out a lot and watch the race together and at the track, sitting in the motorhome, and it was never – ever any issues with Joss as far as I could see. And he never talked about it and everything was totally cool. But, you know, maybe you're right, but it's water under the bridge, I would say. Mm. I know it's a cliche, but I think getting the right driver in that car for next year for Red Bull, given how everybody else is now knocking on the door, Ferrari, hopefully Mercedes one day, certainly McLaren, that they need, you know, they need to make sure they've got somebody doing a slightly better job than Sergio Perez. And I think Carlos Sainz would. Yeah, yeah, really good shout, Mr. Vincent. Yeah, I, you know, I just, I, as I say, for me, you know, whether it's helmet, if I was science now, I'd be on the phone to them for sure. And, and I'd be saying, look, you know, let's do this deal because it's the logical thing. Let's do it. It'd be strange. It'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? If, if, if Christian said, okay, let's do it, deal's on. And then William said, no, no, we're not releasing Carlos Sainz. We've got to have him because we've got a world championship winning car next year and we oh. want him to win the world championship. <laughs> I can't imagine they would, but, you know. <laughs> Good. I've always got to do that deal, but I'm sure Williams would take a bit of money, wouldn't they? To, and that budget they could put towards running Colo Pinto would be a perfect deal for them as well. It, it wouldn't be a bad deal financially. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people at Williams would want to keep Colo Pinto. It's kind of strange to give him all these races and then they got to say goodbye to him. Yeah, yeah. But that's a James Vowles led decision that he needs. He, he's got to have the best available, hasn't he? And science apparently was the best available. But I, think, I still think it's a shame, Peter, to your point earlier, that a, a driver of Carlos Sainz's calibre is going to be laid to waste in a car that clearly isn't oh, capable of ridiculous. winning races. Yeah. Formula, if that happens, Formula One as a whole should be ashamed of itself to let a driver of that quality, uh, well, Ferrari too, obviously, um, and they should be ashamed of themselves because this guy is not only very, very good, but he's so charismatic and he's also a very nice person. And he's one of the few drivers that doesn't shout and scream whenever he's on the pole or win a race. He's quite quite um, controlled in the way he, quite respectful in the way he gets out of the car. And he's, yeah, of course, he's he's absolutely overjoyed, but he, you know, he just, I just think he brings another dimension of sporting behavior to Formula One, which is a nice thing to have. You know, he's a good man. He's a good guy. And he keeps his mouth shut most of the time if he doesn't have something good to say. And I think that's a very important quality as well. I've got a lot of respect for Carlos Sainz. And I think Formula One is very lucky to have somebody of that sort of dignity and quality. 100%. But very well said. Let's talk about Mercedes as we round third base, Mr. Windsor, because I did some uh, very nutty maths and, and they're close in the driver's standings, right? But if you normalise for the circumstance that was spa Franco charm, all of a sudden, George Russell would have the whip hand 190 points, 193 points, I want to say, versus 170 points for Sir Lewis Hamilton. Um, mm. How do you characterise this period of, of Lewis Hamilton's career? Because I know you said that before that you don't think Lewis is past his prime, that give him a good car, um, a new lease of life um, at Maranello, and it, he'll be right back on it. Are you still of that opinion, Peter? Because a lot of people over the past, between now and the last time that we've spoken, Eddie Jordan has come out and said that Ferrari are making a mistake in signing Lewis. David Coulthard said similar, that you're not going to get yourself a seven-time champion, Lewis, not the 2018 Lewis, that this is a 39, soon to be 40-year-old Lewis, and that's a completely different entity as far as a driver going forward. And proof positive of that is the fact that George is beating him so comprehensively in qualifying season to date. Where do you stand on Lewis going to Ferrari, um, Peter? It, it, is it looking more like a mistake by virtue of Lewis's performance this season? Well, his performance this season hasn't surprised me, and I think he's actually driven very well, considering he's a seven-times world champion, and he's got this amazing hot shot in the other car, and they don't have a winning car, and he's always scrabbling around, you know, in the minor positions, it must be incredibly difficult to remain incentivized. Terrible word, but it's probably the appropriate one. Mm. And yet he has, basically, and he gave George a pretty good race. I mean, I'm sure a younger gun, I'm sure Liam Lawson would have got past George sooner than Lewis did. But, you know, give him his due, he did in the end. And and he, 
for a seven times champion, as I keep saying, I think he's driven incredibly well. You've got to bear that in mind. That's who he is. I've always said, I don't think you can, there's no point in comparing him with how he was at Mercedes. Cause when, with other, when, when critics say, well, you're not going to get the seven times world champion. What are they talking about? The one that was beaten by Nico Rosberg, uh, you know? Um, so it's not as if it's Lewis was always dominant uh, in, in Mercedes and A, A and B, it was a very different time when Mercedes definitely had the, the best car and they won't be in that situation next year for sure, because McLaren at least will be there. Maybe Red Bull will be back and possibly Mercedes. So they won't be there. A and B, he's got Charles Leclerc in the other car, which is a very different situation as well, because when he joined Mercedes, he wasn't joining a team where there was another driver who had been doing a lot of winning and knew that team inside out. That's the situation at Ferrari. So for anybody to think that Lewis will go to Ferrari and blow Charles Leclerc into the weeds and win the world championship is unbelievably naive and stupid, really. What he will do, in my opinion, is if the car is not a winner and a difficult car, like, say, the Mercedes is this year, and that might well be the case next year, who knows, I think you'll see it about the same as the George Lewis ratio now. Oh. I think if the car is a very good car and they can really get on top of things like tyre warm-up and all the things that Lewis likes when he's about to start his lap – and it's got a nice sweet spot that allows him to do what he can do in a race situation when the crosswinds come and the oil goes down or whatever it is and the tires begin to go off. Then I think you're going to see Lewis winning not as many races as Charles, but maybe let's say Charles wins. If they've got a very good car capable of winning the world championship, let's say Charles wins, I don't know, for the sake of argument, eight races. I think Lewis can win four races in addition. And I think, I don't think he'll beat Charles to the championship, but I think he'll be in the top three of the world championship. That's how, that's how I imagine Lewis's Ferrari career will go. If it's a good car, if it's a good car, if it's a bad car, I think Charles will get the better of him as, as George has. Oh. Why would he, you know, he, he won't be any different. So we got, you've got to make those two provisors and what sort of car they've got. It's a, it's a good shout. Although I hope that you're wrong, Mr. Windsor. Far for, mm. it, far for it to be me to disagree with you on that. Mm. I, I hope Lewis, I, I, I I'm pinning my my hopes on the fact that I think Lewis can be more consistent in a good car as versus Charles. But again, it's in. Um, oh, I, I see what you mean. You know, I don't think so. If it's a good car, I think Charles will be a little bit like Nigel Mansell in back end of '85. Oh. Wow, this is a racing car. I've never driven one of these before. What's it like? <laughs> you know, it'll be just. It's just so easy to drive. I've got traction and turning. I can't believe it. Isn't that? Isn't what Charles going to do? And he's just going to find it so easy when he's got a decent Ferrari under his belt for the change yeah they're used to driving these knife edgy things yeah not that the ferrari is that knife edgy now but it obviously was in the race in mexico for him yeah I think, um, I think towards the end he was struggling with tired egg wasn't he and that's why he had the cheeky yeah. oversteer moment go on then peter as we round third base let me pitch yep. this finally at you yes um brazilian grand prix mm. um who have you got <laughs> wet or dry oh uh, yeah, yeah. Well, this is the, this is the the automotive problem that they have to solve for. Uh, what's the forecast? Well, the forecast isn't worth anything in Brazil, isn't know. it? Yeah, if it's wet, I think Max got half a chance. If it's dry, I can't see McLaren losing it. To be honest, too many corners, be too hard on tires, and they're quick enough in a straight line to do it. And yeah, you know, in theory, Lando should win it from Oscar. But whether or not they're able to control Oscar is another matter, of course. Mm. And if Lando isn't great in qualifying and Oscar's on the front row and Lando's third row, then, you know, all bets are off and somebody like Leclerc could come back and win it again. We always say this about Lando and McLaren, Peter, going into a race mm. weekend and then they do what they always do and seize defeat from the jaws of victory, right? I mean, if I, I have no <laughs> doubt that Lando can put it on pole, 1,000%. One, 1, yeah. Can he get into turn one? Before well, Max Verstappen, I, I, I he mean, did in, he did in Austin, didn't he? Just <laughs> barely. I mean, that, but he qualified. If memory serves, I remember he was first into the into the braking area. I think wasn't he? Just yeah. I I, but, I, rem I remember the last time. I want to say in twenty twenty two potentially there was a sprint race around there, and Lando dropped it on pole, and then Max again just stole his lunch money into turn yeah, one. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I think Lando will be fine around Brazil. I think I think Red Bull have got a major problem how to beat Lando around Brazil, and I'd be shocked if he doesn't win it in the dry. 
And it's not that difficult to lead into the first corner in Brazil, to it's be honest. It's downhill. Well, it's downhill as well. Not that, you know, it's just, it's an inviting thing. You've got the pole. Pole is a big advantage there, as distinct from Mexico, where it's not that big an advantage, or mm. Austin for that matter. So if he's on the pole, it's difficult to see how Lando's going to lose this one. Yeah. And I think it looks like Red Bull are going to be struggling again, really struggling. And we're going to see more fireworks, I would imagine. And, you know, if McLaren had got any sort of structure at all to their strategy, they should be saying all effort on Lando getting the pole, deal done, and make sure Max is, make sure Oscar's qualifying somewhere near Max because we want, you know, fireworks between those two. That's then, what you'd do if you're at McLaren, I think. Absolutely. And then for the championship, Peter, drivers, who, well, who, who are you picking? Uh, well, uh, now that McLaren have lost potentially, it's gone up from 34, in my opinion, to probably, what, 30, 38 now, because they didn't run him in FP1. So I think he would have won that race. So it's 38 points that he's now not getting. So on that basis, you say he's still got to give it to, to Max, I think. But imagine if Lando had 38 points more now than he actually has. What, who would you be giving it to now? Unbelievable, Peter. That video Lando that you put Norris. together is is absolutely crazy that they've yeah. given away so many points because of mm. their ineptitude. Well, the one that still still staggers me is is Baku. That business of bringing them in just before the end of, of, of Q1 into the pit lane and they go out again and Charles stays out, gets a time to get into Q2 and they send them out to do one lap at the end of Q1 when the track's absolutely packed. It's pretty obvious you're going to get a yellow or a, you know, bit of traffic in the right way, aren't you? You know, Oscar just scrapes through, Lando gets the yellow. You can't blame the yellow. You can't blame Ocon for that. What are they doing putting him out at that point? They're, they're making life harder for themselves than need be, I think. Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully they'll... Um learn the lessons peter for the next three races because i still think they've got a, a massive opportunity there not necessarily that lando will win the drivers i think that train's left the station but to just optimize for their circumstance they can win they can win all three of those races if they've had their weetabix in the morning but i just i don't know i think it'll be i think lando andrea stella and zach brown will regret like you said, 38 points or whatever, uh, particularly if they don't deliver for the remaining races in, in the season. It's um, Yeah, but just to re reiterate the point, that's what they said before Mexico. I think the quote was, with five races to go, every point counts. So on that basis, we're going to stand down our lead driver in FP1. <laughs> they didn't finish the sentence there, you know. But that's what I don't get. You know, there's all these constant platitudes about we must score every point, and yet, they keep doing things like that. Yeah. Oh, Vita. Vita. Seizing defeat from the jaws of victory. What did we think of Pado Award anyway? Was it worth it? Um, no, it wasn't worth it. Um, <laughs> but, but, but they'll get this. I thought he from. drove quite well. Actually. He was quite quick, wasn't he? But, you know, and he's a good guy. But at that point of the championship, no, why would no. you do that? Do they have to schedule them in advance, though? They've got to do so many rookie runs a season, right? I, I'm yeah, not but, sure. Uh, yeah, but why do they do that? Why yeah. in Mexico? You know, do it early, do it earlier. Great. Oh. Why didn't they run Rio in it anyway? If you're going to do anything like that and take Lando out of the car, at least do something for the future, like the Japanese driver, and try to get your bed into bed with Toyota. You know, at least that made some commercial sense yeah. from my point of view. Um, yeah. You know, maybe down the road they're going to want Toyota engines, so run him. Hero Kawa, I think he's called. Yeah, and yeah. and yet they didn't do that. I mean, what? Maybe you can explain this. What is the future of Pato Award at McLaren F1? I don't get it. I don't get it either. They've got too many young, hungry lions, haven't they? Yeah. Bartoletto, like, what are they? I don't know, Peter. And, and by the fact that they don't want to loan out Bartoletto, it makes me realise if Bartoletto can win F2, that he will probably be the next one up. I don't know where, I don't know where, where O'Ward fits into that queue, to be honest. Mm. No, very strange. Um, I can only assume it's something along the lines of, you know, if you do this, do that, we'll give you a test in Formula One, you know, as a, as a big thank you or whatever. But what a time to do that. It's ridiculous. And what, were the, what, were the, what was all that business of running Berman in the Ferrari? What was that all about? And Schwartzman in the Sauber? I just think they scheduled Why the Why do runs. they need to do that anyway? I mean, Berman's got his drive. Why don't they just keep Charles in the car? He needs the seat time on a weekend like that. I think I think they've got to do so many of those runs and they schedule them in advance. I think the question is around the scheduling. If indeed you think that you're going to be, especially from McLaren's perspective, I suppose they'd argue, Peter, that they weren't to know that they were going to be, or, nor did they anticipate being in a a, a title fight 
of of any description, not the constructors. I understand that, but put him in Oscar's car at least. Oh yes, I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Easy solve, Peter. <laughs> yeah. That's why you're the world championship winning team. No, right? no, I mean it's not bad. I'm sure there's another. I'm sure it's because Oscar was the last guy to stand down, and they had to do it in turns. You know, a bit like the whole Hungary thing. Oh well, you know, we agreed. You know, and even though this could be good for Lando's championship, we agreed we better let Oscar win the race. Yeah. Jeez. It's uh, mistake central. Oh, Mr. Windsor, what are we going to do? You, you've been a legend as always. <laughs> well, it's far been good fun as ever, Cam. Thanks so much, buddy. Far too generous with your time, sir. And if you like insight around all things F1 from Peter D. Windsor, go and check out that Chaps YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed already, what are you doing with your life? Mm -hmm. Shortly thereafter, go onto your favourite podcasting platform and drop five stars and follow the Short Corners podcast. Again, Peter D. Windsor's market leading expertise and F1 insight in podcast format. If you're watching this on the YouTube, do me a favour, like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. And as always, between now and next time, that has been Peter D. Windsor. I've been Cameron CC. Remember, between now and next time, look, but never stare.